If you have finished The Last of Us Part 2 and you need a place to talk about Abby and leave, this is the video for you. Hey guys, I'm McGann, and hopefully I'm welcoming you back to the fangirl. If not, just do me a favor and tap that little subscribe button below. Now, if you haven't beaten The Last of Us Part 2, this is not the video for you because I'm about to drop some big spoilers and I'm gonna talk about the gateway I see for Part 3. So if you're not done with Part 2, run away now. But for the rest of us, let's talk about the murderer Abby Anderson and her little sidekick buddy Leave, no last name given men and leave? Lev? I just beat the game and I've already forgotten how they pronounce his name. But early on in the game, we get a taste of playing as Abby and she's looking for somebody in Jackson. So we know that there is no goodness going on. We just don't really know what it is. Playing as Abby that early on in the game is definitely foreshadowing though, because even though we don't know that we're gonna switch characters midway through, we do know that playing as another character in the Last of Us franchise is pretty rare. So to play as Abby early on, it's like, okay, Okay, prepare yourself now because playing as her again is very likely to resurface. So even though we don't want it and a lot of us grow to hate Abby because she killed Joel, like seriously, the trailers made it look like Joel was gonna be part of the main action of the game, not the catalyst to drive the plot forward. But even though most of us don't like Abby, playing as her in Jackson for that little bit of time really takes away a lot of the shock when we're forced to be Abby for a while. Of course, I didn't expect the game to force us to play as Abby for as long as it did or that I would really grow to have a lot of empathy for her by the end of her story. Yet, as soon as the perspective flips, we see a young Abby having to play the protector role for her father. Papa, or Jerry Anderson to the rest of the world, is one of those older fellows who never really accepted that the world has come to an end. The whole idea of a new normal didn't really process for him. So instead of accepting the new world order of things, Jerry really fought and studied and wanted to make a cure to fix humanity. But Jerry had also been so sheltered, probably for his entire life, that he had no idea how to sense any of the danger that was around him. So here's dad out in the wide world of the infected, trying to work with zebras and stuff of all the strange things to do with your time now. And then there's poor Abby, who's training like a soldier every day and basically losing her mind because her father is so reckless with his own well-being. Which means right away, Abby becomes more like this protective mama bear to her father than she is his daughter. The roles are flipped and Abby's protecting dad instead of the other way around. Nevertheless, Abby adores her father and she thinks he's about to save the world when whoops! Jerry tried to save the world by taking someone else's world away. So Joel ends up killing Jerry at the end of the first game to save Ellie. And I really used to hate that part of the game where you're just forced to kill that first doctor, like there's no way around killing him at all. But then my oldest kid pointed something out to me. Nobody made Jerry play the hero there. Again, Jerry had such little sense of danger that he'd go traipsing around the infected world with no weapons or guards or anything. So when Jerry sees a fellow human being like Joel, he sees zero threat in that situation either and decides he's gonna stand his ground and stomp his feet and not let Ellie go. <laughs> Boy, did he gamble and lose on that one. And I totally get it from Abby's perspective. You're a teenage kid, you feel like it's your job to protect your father, and then all of a sudden this brute comes and kills him. You're gonna feel a certain way about that. Abby was on her dad's side so much that she agreed with him that they should kill Ellie, even though, again, I mean, this is a really premature, quick thing to do. In fact, Jerry wants to kill Ellie off so fast that he doesn't even give her time to be woken up and given a choice. I mean, the infection has been going on for what, like 15 years at this point? There was time! If they would have let Ellie wake up and let her choose her own fate, we'd have a completely different ending for part one. But no, Jerry knew best. And he was probably so used to talking circles around anybody who disagreed with him that when he saw Joel holding him up at gunpoint, he just figured, hey, I can talk my way out of this one too. But from Abby's standpoint, none of that really matters because her situation is guard dad, dad dead, now what? So now we have adult Abby who really doubled down on that soldier thing so much so that I'd say her rigorous training and sort of I have to do everything the military way is probably what drove her and Owen apart. Owen was definitely more of a free spirited type and it's certainly difficult to be in a relationship with somebody who's not only obsessed 
obsessed over revenge, but who is also such a by-the-book soldier that even the non-revengey parts of her life are just constantly, we have to do it this specific way. Everything with Abby revolves around training, missions, and revenge. I mean, it's tiring, right? Really, though, I guess it kind of pays off for her because Abby is built like a freaking tank. Seriously, I spent the entire game wondering if she was supposed to be a trans character because even when her nude scene came up, I mean, she was totally flat chested and she had a very masculine physique. Oh, and then there was when Owen <laughs> had at her, he went from behind, if you notice, which I mean, it feels a little bit unusual for the situation, but who knows? Who knows? Maybe that's their thing. I won't judge. But I mean, seeing Abby as a teenager too, I, she kind of looks more feminine there, so I don't think she's supposed to be trans. Chances are she's probably just taking steroids or something with the wolves, but I think it's something that could definitely be debated. But hey, you know, there are no wrong answers until Naughty Dog says so. And I think this is a good spot to fold Lev into the mix. I had the impression that Abby imprinted herself on Lev so much because they were both trans people, but that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. Owen also took an interest in those kids, and since Abby was kind of toying with wanting Owen's affection back, getting close to Lev and Yara was definitely a way to get Owen's attention too. Abby doesn't even try to hide it, really. As soon as Owen explains why he's giving up on the wolves and why he feels sympathy for the scars, Abby immediately finds herself being in the same boat emotionally too. Yes, I know, Lev saves Abby's life when they first meet, so Abby's kind of in this I owe you one position. But then Lev does start to do some stupid stuff pretty regularly that I don't know that I would have stuck around to deal with, honestly. But first Lev decides he's gonna shave his head before he runs away, which gets his sister involved and ultimately forces her arm to get amputated. Of course, that's not what Lev intended, but that's what happened because of the choice he made. Lev even admits that he should have ran away and not involved his sister at all, and yeah, you should have, kid. But then, for no good reason and knowing darn well it's a bad idea, Lev decides he's gonna go back to his island to rescue his Seraphite mother, knowing full well that that woman had already disowned Lev for being trans and Yara for following him. And then Lev has to kill his mom because, duh, she takes his return badly. Not to mention all the people who get killed on the Seraphite island because Abby comes to save Lev. I'm just saying, I'm not sure what the intent of Lev is supposed to be, but Abby's story arc pretty much boils down to everything being Lev's fault. Even the scars being out in full force, which makes a lot of problems for Abby, are all because Lev chose to shave his head. Yes, Lev does cut Abby down from a noose, but the guy who hung Abby would have arguably not been out at all if not for Lev. Then directly because of Lev's decision, his sister Yara and his mother end up dead. So the whole idea of inclusion really becomes this muddled message when Lev is like the harbinger of doom in this game. But on the other hand, this scrawny, helpless kid who really had no sense of danger or how to protect himself really hit a nerve with Abby. In Abby's head, Lev is essentially her dad without the alleged medical degrees. Lev is such a this feels right so I'm doing it kind of character that it activates Abby's guard dog personality. And Abby ends up bonding so strongly to Lev that that he can influence her like nobody else can. The only reason that Dina got to live is because Lev stepped in and shallowly asked Abby to stop. Think about it. Abby the tank, the queen of revenge, is about to kill a pregnant girl in retaliation for Ellie killing her pregnant friend and her lover, and Lev just steps in like Jesus and stops Abby. Lev doesn't get in her face, he doesn't yell at her, he doesn't try to reason with her, he doesn't try to physically stop her because good luck there, but Lev has become so ingrained with Abby's feelings for her father that when he says, drop it girl, Abby acts like some obedient Rottweiler and drops Dina and leaves. The Abby-Lev dynamic silently becomes so complex that Abby refrained from being the killer she's trained herself to be and goes back into being the protector that she was with her father. But skipping ahead to the very end of the game where Ellie's missing a few fingers and Abby and Lev are off on their own 
path, what does that leave us for A Last of Us Part 3? Well, you know, the first game started a wrong that was never righted, both with the apocalypse starting and the cure being taken away from mankind, even though I still think the Fireflies would not have done very good humanitarian things with a vaccine. But that means that Part 3 has a built-in story already waiting to happen. Abby is taking Lev and they are on their way to find whatever's left of the Fireflies. Normally, that would feel like an open-ended quest or a mission impossible that had no chance of success, but since part two did take the trouble to have Abby find the little radio setup that connected straight with the fireflies, I think that she is definitely dedicated enough that she will 100% make her way back to them. Ellie, I believe, will hopefully make her way over to Jackson and patch things up with Dina, even though I'm kind of iffy about whether or not that would work out. I think once you throw down an ultimatum of no, you can't can't go hunt this person down and they do it, there's really no going back in the relationship from there. The trust is all gone and broken. But whether Dina and Ellie work out or not, I really want to see Ellie deal with her PTSD issues and continue working on that until one day when Abby strolls back into Jackson. Now, I don't think Abby would be there to fight, but to tell Ellie that the Fireflies are back together and they have new doctors who have analyzed her father's notes. And then Ellie finally gets to make that big decision. Will you give your life to save humanity. And that's my expectation, is to end the trilogy with Ellie sacrificing herself to make a cure. Or, you know, maybe the Fireflies have finally picked up a competent doctor and he can make a cure without having to kill the only immune person in the world. Like I said in my Joel video, you only get one shot to make a vaccine with Ellie's brain. It's not gonna respawn so that you can try again when you screw it up. But I guess we'll see what Naughty Dog has in store and whether or not a part three is in their cards although with the way everything ended in such an open-ended format and how successful the game has been, I can't see them not giving us a third game. It would be inconceivable. And I might be overthinking it, but that's literally my job. Oh, and hey, no derps at the end of this video because I don't want it to feel like a joke or a gamey type of thing here, but I would like to ask sort of a generalized-ish question about Lev. I've heard a lot of negative feedback about his character and how because they dead named him that that's completely unacceptable and the whole game is trash because of it and they everybody hates leave because of it. And I agree that his story could have used some tweaks because, like I mentioned, everything really boils down to being Lev's fault. But overall, I, I really like that character, so it's kind of like bizarre to me that so many people detest him. So would anybody share with me what about Lev is so unacceptable? I understand trans people do not want to be dead named, but with the situation of the Seraphites not accepting who he was and wanting to kill him over it, you know, these religious zealots calling him Lily not only made sense in the context, but it also allowed everyone to realize that Love was trans without having to come out and directly say it. And that hatred that Love was getting from the people he was raised with, I, I found that very empathetic. It brought a whole new dimension to the character and shown this bright light of how awful people are when they treat trans trans people like that. So for me, I really like Lev and I understand why they called Lev Lily, but I'm very curious to find out why that context and that situation would be so unacceptable. But anyways, thanks for watching and we'll see you guys in the next video. If they had let what- if they had let what- if they had let Ellie wake- if they had let what- Abby be- Dina, I would not be too- I don't- well, family members, we're almost done, but I want to invite you to hang out with me in some other places. I'm on Twitter and Instagram as my own personal self, and I have a Facebook page too, but I mostly just post photos over there. And sometimes people say, hey, McGann, I want to mail you something. How do I do that? Easy. Just click the About tab on my channel page, and my most current P.O. Box info will be right there. I also run another channel, The Family. It's really a hodgepodge channel where we might post anything. Oh yeah, and I also sell shirts and stickers and stuff with the family and the fangirl logos. If that is your cup of tea, I have a link in every description of every video. Finally, if you want to help out the fangirl channel and make sure I'm putting out video essays for years to come, the best way you can help is by subscribing and watching more of my videos, whether they're new, old, whatever. Maybe even share one or two on social media, help spread the word. 
people who watch to the end of videos like you helps to tell the site, hey, this is a good video, we should recommend it to other people. So if you made it this far, leave me a comment of something like, hey, I made it to the end. Love ya. See you next time, family members. Bye.